probably five and a half. First, some people want to get into space uh, for uh, national glory. Um, to show how mighty a particular nation is, um, how advanced it is, how uh, in charge it is. Uh, second, and this is related, um, there are military reasons to want to go into space, uh, military to, to make sure that you can uh, secure decent positions for your satellites, to make sure we know what other nations are doing, uh, to make sure other nations know that we have the uh, wherewithal to um, obliterate them if we if we would like to. And this, of course, is behind the creation of the United States Space Force. Another reason to go to space, of course, is scientific curiosity, just to figure out what's out there and what's going on with it. Um, lots of different motivations there to find out what we're made of and where we came from, whether there might be life elsewhere, whether there may have been life elsewhere. Another reason is a frontierism um, that is supposed to be inherent to the human condition. Like, it is the nature of man always to want to expand and do new things and seek out new frontiers. Uh, so there is, is said to be, um, and it's usually, it's often politicians who are speaking this way, an inherent restlessness to the human spirit uh, that space might let us enact, that space might um, satisfy. Increasingly, we have a desire to go to space um, for what I would call utopian reasons. Um, people want to go to space to start a new society, to uh, enact possibilities elsewhere that we haven't been able to enact on Earth. Very similar to the kinds of uh, reasons that um, sort of rosy historians often attribute to uh, the journey of Europeans across the Atlantic to build a new life in, uh, in the Americas. So those are the five reasons, uh, frontier, glory, militarism, utopianism, scientific curiosity. Uh, the, the half one would be money. It is not yet a good bet financially. Space space is super expensive. Uh, there is so far not a lot of return on your investment, no return on your investment at the moment. It's all a totally speculative economy. Um, but there are plenty of people who are trying to imagine a new space economy um, where materials, for example, are mined in space to build stuff we need in space to put stuff in space. And if that new space economy emerges, then it might actually be possible to make money in space. And that would be the place to, and that would be uh, another reason to go. They're absolutely intertwined, um, but they're not necessarily all um, working in concert with each other. Sometimes they work against one another. Sometimes they work um, even antagonistically uh, but they're all working in relation to one another and all of them depend on one another. Um, so for example, uh, there is a massive frustration in the, what I would call the utopian scientific community with the slowness of NASA. They move so slowly, you can't get them to, they, they think of an idea and they're like, all right, maybe 30 years in the future, this is what we'll do, right? Um, I'm, I'm, using, I'm using a US example here, um, but for the most part, um, nation-based space agencies tend to be fairly slow. China's moving pretty fast, um, but historically, the nation states move slowly. Um, so the corporate, um, the corporate, based utopianism of the contemporary space race is um, hoping to be able eventually to sidestep the nationally based space programs entirely because they're just so slow. Um, national and international. I mean, if, if nations are slow, the United Nations are even slower, right? It's, it's these political processes are so slow um, that the, the, the sort of corporate utopian motivation for getting into space wants to go faster and faster and faster. It wants ultimately to sidestep. But in the meantime, it relies upon those national structures and those space programs um, to, to, to get it, to, well, early on for funding um, and uh, for resources and for airspace and for, so it's totally reliant upon the national structure that it's totally frustrated with also and looking to, to uh, get itself free from. Um, so this is one kind of uh, entanglement. Um, similarly seen from the other side, uh, an, an outfit like NASA is a little bit worried about the sort of corporate um, 
intentions of folks like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and um, even Boeing. Um, but at the same time, they need it. They need people to help bring them stuff, bring stuff up to the International Space Station. They need the so there's a this this mutual reliance. Um, scientists tend to be very wary of, for example, the militarizing of space, um, and now increasingly of the corporatizing of space. Scientists themselves are um, academic scientists, very concerned about this. At the same time, they need the funding that comes through those channels in order to fund the projects that they're. So there's this, um, again, I would call it like an antagonistic reliance of these different interests upon one another. I'm concerned. I am concerned that when Elon Musk says in the small print of the contract that one signs to engage Starlink satellite service, that Mars is a free planet and no earthly agency has sovereignty over it, that he is A, laying claim to a planet that first he's never been on and none of us has ever been on. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't belong to anybody. Um, and that B, this shows that he is looking very much to find a way to operate outside the, the, the constraints of national or international law. Whether or not he ever gets to Mars, he's looking to find a way to operate outside the constraints of national or international law. The man launched a Tesla Roadster, an entire car, into orbit around the sun just because he felt like he could do it. And it's not like there was, he violated any international regulation because nobody thought to make a regulation about that. Like you can't launch a car into space. So he just did this. And now there's this huge piece of rubbish. And if something does hit it, it becomes even more pieces of rubbish that become more space garbage. Um, so he's just sort of tangential to the law. Like he he, he plays within it when he needs to, uh, he doesn't when he doesn't need to. And I think that he's looking not to have to. Um, and the problem again is the, the slowness of the legislative process. Um, that what I think we're going to see playing, what we're already seeing playing out and what we're going to see intensifying um, is the legal logistics of the frontier, which in earthly history, at least, um, has looked a bit like the existing national bodies give a kind of freedom to some parties. Those parties take that freedom to go do new things on the frontier. And then the legal framework says, oh, wait, hang on a second. How do we catch up with that to figure out how to legislate the activity that is already going on on the frontier? I don't think that earthly law first knows what it's going to have to legislate, not completely at least. So it doesn't know how to write the laws that are going to obtain in space, particularly when we have permanent outposts in space, um, first. And second, it doesn't move quickly enough. It doesn't move as fast as capital. It doesn't move as fast as corporations. It doesn't move as fast as messianic figures like Elon Musk. The corporate scientific structure is bound up with religion. Um, that seems to be a ridiculous claim. Um, corporations, for the most part, will say we have absolutely nothing to do with religion. Um, scientists, of course, always claim that they have absolutely nothing to do with religion. Um, but I do see a fascinating and troubling um, recapitulation, reenactment of uh, some old European uh, religious themes in this contemporary race to space. Um, and here's where I think you can find them. Um, you can find them, first of all, in really boring, easy to find places. Um, you can find them, for example, when um, Mike Pence two years ago said to the National Space Council, uh, we are going back to the moon and then we're gonna go to Mars and God's hand will guide us, quoting Psalm 139. This is explicit invocation of a uh, divine justification 
location for a human adventure and specifically uh, a European descended, mainly white human adventure, a uh, very wealthy human adventure uh, into the stars. Donald Trump said just about a year ago uh, that we are going back to the moon and we are going to Mars because it is America's manifest destiny to do so. This concept of manifest destiny is an old and unsavory one. The idea was that God wanted uh, European descended American citizens to expand throughout the entire North American continent. Enormous tracts of land were given to primarily white American uh, citizens um, in the Midwest and then eventually in the West. Um, they, they took those tracts of land, they farmed them, they made homesteads there. This was the homesteading era. Um, but of course the US government could only give this land to light-skinned um, European de descended people by taking it from Native Americans. So they forced Native Americans off their land, they forced them into reservations, they forced them out of reservations, they moved the reservations. Um, they, they, they impaired many of them, they killed many of them, they forcibly relocated so that uh, white Americans could fulfill their, their uh, allegedly um, divine calling to uh, move across the continent. Um, so when Trump says it is our manifest destiny to go into the stars, he is saying that that same story, that same story that justified uh, Americans' uh, expansion over the entire continent is now justifying this sort of vertical extension into the space. He's explicitly invoking God. He's explicitly invoking a transcendent reason, um, a transcendent justification for America's um, self-assertion. This is what this is what he is doing explicitly. But then there's this, there's a more subtle way that religion is working here. There's a great scholar of religion, Jonathan Z. Smith, who used to say that there are two major kinds of religions. There's a, there are locative religions um, that stay in one place and try to make sure that the universe sort of holds together in the place that it's always been. And there are utopian religions that say, you know what, our real home, our true home is somewhere else. It is out there. It is not where we are. It is there. It is somewhere else. Um, and utopian religions, of course, Christianity is a is a is a significant utopian religion. Um, for the most part, Christian traditions have taught that we are sort of sojourners on this earth for a time, and that eventually we will uh, we will die and we will be uh, reunited with the the source of our being. We will be we will go back to the place that we came from. We will be. Um, uh, reunited certainly with our loved ones, but also with our creator and that our true home is there in heaven somewhere else. So this utopian impulse to say, this earth is not our home is a profoundly religious impulse. So this earth is not our home. We have a home somewhere else in some place that you can only imagine that you've never seen. Experientially, Mars is only a little more filled in for us than like heaven. That impulse to promise a perfect existence elsewhere in a truly inaccessible other realm um, is a profoundly religious impulse. And in this way, Elon Musk himself um, really is a kind of self-appointed messiah, a self-appointed savior who's saying, how dare you say that I am in this for the money? How dare you say that I'm in this for the glory? I am looking to save humanity. But what this promise to save humanity relies on is a previous um, drumming up of the threat of disaster. Elon Musk can only sell the salvation that he's selling by convincing all of us that there is an imminent disaster, that we are um, we are about to be obliterated in some way, that Earth is about to become uninhabitable for human beings, that Earth can't sustain human beings. So increasingly you're hearing among the kind of space Nick community um, that uh, Earth is done. Earth is done. There is, it is no longer going to be able to support life. Uh, it is certainly not going to be able to support um, the number of human beings uh, we are we are filling the earth with. Something is going to wipe us out, climate disaster or maybe a virus disaster. And faced with this imminent disaster, we are going to have to find somewhere else to go. So it's a sort of two-step that Elon Musk is making, disaster and salvation. There's a coming disaster. I am your way out. I am your ticket out somewhere else. So Jeff Bezos is a different kind of space savior. Jeff Bezos might be more of a locative type. So Bezos is selling a different kind of vision, which is to say he's not abandoning the Earth. He's uh, looking to restore the Earth by 
making us leave. The current pace of life is immutable, that there is no other way to be, that of course we all have to be this technological, this consumptive, this comfortable. Our only option is to abandon the earth, either by leaving it forever a la Musk or by leaving it to itself a la Bezos. But what neither of them is asking is, um, is there not any other way to live upon the earth? Is there not any other way to live here? It is, on the one hand, sincere and not a front. And what I mean is, I think that Musk and Bezos are genuinely convinced that humanity is good, Huma their, their understanding of humanity, which is this um, sort of universal uh, assumption of a particular kind of human that they spend a lot of time with. Um, but that humanity is good, that humanity is worth saving, and that humanity, this salvation of humanity is worth any kind of, like any effort that we can put into it at all costs. Okay. Um, I do not believe that they are selling the Mars and rotating spheres stories just as a means to increase Tesla's stock or uh, increase Amazon's or Blue Origin's stock or something like that. I don't I don't think it is that sinister. I think they, they really do think that they can save people. On the other hand, um, the people they intend to save can only be a very small, um, very privileged subset of humanity, along with a slightly larger, very underprivileged subset of humanity that is willing to work for those people and make their lives very comfortable. Um, because you don't get 74 degrees, perfect Maui weather, everything working great um, without a whole host of humans and robots who are laboring constantly to make sure that that privileged class feels comfortable. Is Musk going to save the human race? Well, if you imagine that by, by transporting some people to Mars um, and letting everybody else fend for themselves on Earth, that constitutes salvation, sure. Um, it, do we have any vision of getting everybody off planet or getting everybody saved? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. It's going to be some super wealthy people and laborers. It's not a universal human idea. Um, the idea that it's uh, okay and even necessary for a subset of humanity uh, to go elsewhere and take that land. For example, the University of Hawaii and NASA have been trying for years to construct a 13th telescope on Mauna Kea it's to you know, see farther back into the cosmos than we have been able to see with other terrestrial uh, telescopes. Native or Kanaka Hawaiians have said, please don't construct this telescope. This mountain is sacred. It is the inhabitation of the ancestors. It is itself an ancestor. It's the connection between the heavens and the earth. It's immensely important to indigenous Hawaiians and we are begging you please not to construct another telescope here and degrade the land further and degrade the indigenous uh, life forms that are there and to move them off their mountain. The big difficulty here is not so much a political one and not so much a scientific one. It's, it's like a metaphysical misunderstanding and it's an ethical misunderstanding as to what counts as life and what counts as worthy of protection. For the most part, Western scientists and Western politicians <laughs> think of mountains as resources, as things that are there for humans to use as they need to use them for recreation or for, uh, for um, extraction of uh, 
a fuel or things like that, or um, or as, as a location, as a place to be. Um, for Indigenous Hawaiians, the mountain isn't a resource, it's not a location, it's an ancestor, it's a sacred site, it's a, it's a temple. You have to relate to it, you have to interact with it as a person in its own right. The difficulty here is um, in seeing that it could be that land itself has rights and land itself has person and land itself ought to be taken care of. Um, so if we were to take that understanding that land itself has rights and land itself um, needs to be cared for and related to rather than just exploited and used, um, we might get a really different picture of what it's all right to do, say, on Mars, or what it's all right to do on the moon, or what it's all right to do on an asteroid. Um, is it okay to go to the moon and put a mine there and to establish little outposts? Did like did the moon ask us? It may sound like a ridiculous question, but like, is that all right? And these are questions that I would like us to ask. And I think that they're questions that um, numerous different communities uh, on our planet, including Indigenous Hawaiians, including Aboriginal Australians who have their own long history of astronomy, um, might help uh, Western explorers to ask and answer about how it's possible to relate ethically to land that is not on the earth, um, to other, other kinds of landforms. I think that there are ways to um, enable beautiful conversations, particularly between, say, indigenous activists on the one hand and scientists on the other, um, by means of a shared attention to the importance of land. Scientists love land. Scientists, you know, geologists love rocks. They often talk about the life cycle of rocks, right? Rocks, which are, which I think, you know, kind of ordinary Western everyday people like me tend to think are just like just rocks. A geologist doesn't think a rock is just a rock. A geologist thinks that a rock, you know, begins in some kind of, well, begins as like star stuff and then becomes a mountain and then it falls off the mountain and then it goes into the sea and then it gets kicked around and then it gets moss on it and then some somebody retrieves it from the ocean. Like it has a whole, and then it becomes sand, right? Um, a rock has a, a whole kind of life cycle. Um, Western scientists do not need to adopt the beliefs or the language of indigenous people in order to say that rocks, for example, are important, um, that rocks, for example, should be uh, cared for and attended to rather than just blasted for a human profit. So I actually think that there's a massively productive conversation that can happen between um, the protectors of the land on our planet um, and Western scientists about the importance of um, what we often call inanimate objects, right? I and mean, even the personhood and the livelihood of inanimate objects. Um, I think there is a great case to be made um, for Western scientists to say, um, if it is primarily important from a scientific standpoint to learn about the history of Mars, but what happened there, about whether or not there was, like what kind of life there was, then we need to proceed as delicately as possible so we don't wreck it, so we can understand, so we don't um, destroy that archaeological site before we learn anything from it. Um, so there are lots of different ways of talking about the importance of the landscape. And again, um, Westerners don't have to steal other people's stories in order to think that um, that rocks are important, um, but it's important to listen to those other stories and then say, okay, what is it within the scientific viewpoint that's actually saying a similar thing in its own kind of language, in its own right? What might be Western scientific reasons, uh, not just to sort of terraform Mars or blast it in order to uh, extract or blast the moon in order to extract resources from it? Um, that's a great conversation. The conversation between, say, indigenous activists uh, and um, the commercial sector is a harder one. That's a harder one. Um, and even between the scientific sector and the commercial se sector uh, can be can be a more difficult one. Once we introduce the issue of commerce, once we introduce the um, 
what seems now to be an imperative to expand the earthly economy into space, to start a new economy in space, uh, there I think very little conversation is possible between uh, people who uh, respect um, land and land formations for its own sake and people who are looking to uh, make a profit and create a new economy in space. Um, and unfortunately, that sector of um, commercial interests in space is very handily supported by the utopian interest in space um, because it is it becomes a very smooth argument to make um, to say look we need a new space economy because earth is about to kill us and we have to go somewhere else and so that economy is going to support the future of humanity so you know you might be obsessing over the personhood of rocks or something like that but in the meantime i'm trying to save humanity so the utopian the corporate interests work very nicely with one another No, I do not think that scientific progress and uh, indigenously inspired anti-colonial work are opposed at all. I think it is possible to make scientific progress um, in a respectful, careful, um, and non-exploitative way. Um, so it is possible to send um, uncrewed missions to Mars, hopefully to Venus, to find out what's going on there, to learn. Those robotic missions can give us um, all kinds of information about what's going on there. We can make tons of scientific progress. We could put, gosh, we could put satellites near the near near Mars. We could put satellites out by Venus. There are some, but we could, you know, we could get we could get all sorts of scientific data and learn and learn and learn through minimal, minimally invasive uh, and minimally destructive and minimally polluting um, uncrewed missions to other planets. We're already doing it and we can we can continue to uh, to expand there. Um, the question of colonizing other planets isn't to my mind, a question of scientific progress at all. That's a sign. That's a, that's that's ideological progress. Um, that's a different kind of progress. Um, is it possible to colonize Mars in a respectful, anti-colonial, uh, indigenously attentive way? I don't know. I have no idea. But that conversation needs to be had, and that's a more complicated question. Um, is it possible to reconcile untrammeled? corporate interest and profiteering with uh, a respectful, gentle way of living on in the cosmos? No. No, absolutely not. I don't think there is. About a decade ago, there was some talk of inscribing a Pepsi logo on the moon so that that's what we see instead of looking at the moon. Many people across political spectrums and differences uh, can agree that, that that is somehow too much. The question is whether other kinds of activities on the moon and on Mars and on asteroids even um, are, are, can be called sort of similarly disrespectful. Um, there are people who will say, um, these bodies are not ours. They are their own. We don't have any right to go up there and do anything to them. We don't even have a right to put a rover on them. We don't have a right to, we certainly don't have a right to put a mine there. We, there, there are people who will argue this. Um, I am a bit of an agnostic with respect to the question of whether it is important to leave all planetary bodies, all other planetary bodies alone because they're not ours. I am an agnostic. Um, but I do think it's important to ask how well we have treated the planet that we do think about as ours, and that we do think about as our home and as available to us, um, and to ask like how that's going. 
The thing that's interesting is that the anti-space crew and the pro-utopian space crew actually all agree we haven't done a great job um, with respect to stewardship of the earth. We haven't done a great job of preserving the, our biosphere, of preserving our home. Um, we can all agree on that. So then the question becomes, is it possible to inhabit another planet without just repeating the same problems? And what I'm concerned about is if the forces that have degraded and destroyed this planet are the forces of a particularly technologized approach to science, not science itself, but a particularly technologized, instrumentalizing approach to science, resource extraction, um, the forced colonization of other peoples for the sake of non-European peoples, for the sake of extracting resources and accumulating wealth. If those are the forces that have contributed to the degradation of this planet, why are those the forces we're allowing to go to other planets to establish new habitats there? Um, send somebody else, send somebody, send anybody else, but don't send the technocrats. The importance of the world, of this world, of this world and all of its flawed ridiculousness everything we are and everything we have and all the places we are going are the product of this world. Things are not going to get better elsewhere. This world is what is deserving of our attention and our concern and our respect and our reverence and our thanks. I think that that could, that could help. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAITV.